turn to 1 Timothy chapter 6 this morning. 1 Timothy chapter 6, we're all very excited. The fall is quickly approaching. It's hard to believe we're already talking about school and back to school and buying things for school and praying for school leaders, but it is around the corner. Very excited about the fall, not only for our students and for our schools, but also here at Woodland Park as we look to... Um, to uh, to strengthen and to uh, to transition some of our discipleship. Again, we've talked about that movement to a, a Sunday night focus for all age groups and um, a, a transition with our children's ministries, positioning in our facilities for their security and a number of other things. And so be praying with us, plan to be engaged, look forward to those things with us. If you're wondering why this is probably one of two or three days out of the year that I would wear a t-shirt to preach in, but I'm always asked as our student camp prepares for the week, I'm always asked if I'll wear their camp t-shirt as a reminder to you to pray for them. And so uh, we'll do that again. And by the way, for if anybody's involved in kids ministry, if you bring me one of those, I'll wear that one next Sunday to celebrate their week. But I do want to encourage you to be praying this week. It's pretty awesome to think that this week we have uh, 50 elementary age kids and then the leaders going with them. We have over 100, more than 110 students who will be going and the leadership going with them. So well over 200 people connected to Woodland Park are going to spend the week this week talking about Jesus and about uh, finding identity in him, understanding who he is, what he has done, who we are in Christ. And if you look historically, almost every great movement, almost every great revival that's happened among the people of God has started among the young people. And so my prayer is that this week as our students and our kids go away and as their leaders are involved in a week of worship and prayer and seeking the Lord, my prayer is that God will begin a revival work among them that they'll bring back that will color and influence homes and lives and our body for the weeks and months ahead will launch us into a strong fall and to see what God wants to do in and through us. And so I would encourage you to be praying with me in that way. But for our time this morning, we are approaching the end of 1 Timothy. I've been praying and thinking and um, our next book in a couple of weeks, we're going to spend some time in one of the minor prophets and I'll wait to tell you what that will be. I, know, I think I know what it is, but I'll wait and let you know in a couple of weeks. And then at the end of, toward the end of this year, we're going to return to 2 Timothy. But we're nearing the end of this letter that is written by Paul to Timothy, his son in the faith. And just remember, all the way back to the very beginning, Paul writes to him as his son in the faith. He, we're reminded that, uh, that Paul probably had a hand in Timothy and his family coming to faith in Christ certainly had a hand in Timothy being discipled and matured as a leader, as a, a man of God, as a teacher, as one to go and plant churches and strengthen churches, had spent about a decade with, uh, with Timothy under his tutelage when this letter is being written. Timothy has been sent now by Paul to Ephesus where the church is facing false teachers and lots of challenges, and Timothy has gone there as a young man to help straighten those things out, to sort of set the church back in a healthy direction. And at various points throughout this letter, we see the sort of loving father nature of Paul to Timothy come through as he encourages him, but also as he challenges him at the same time. Timothy's got a tough assignment. He is he is young, and therefore he certainly doesn't have the, the maturity, he doesn't have the strength of personality or, or, or what have you that Paul had when he was there, and so there, he's looked down on to a certain degree because of his age, he is dealing with some stomach issues, he has some timidity about him. We, we see all these things sort of referenced in this letter, and Paul again and again is encouraging him in spite of those things. Timothy, you've got to, there's something that you were sent there to do, there's something that I want to accomplish through your life, there's something that God is doing in and through you, there's a calling that God has placed upon you. And that calling, though, includes some challenge. It's not an easy assignment. Paul understands that because Paul had been with the leaders at Ephesus a number of years earlier after a number of years ministering there. And in Acts chapter 16, he gather, or Acts chapter 20 rather, he gathers out on the beach with those elders thinking that it could be the last time he would be with those leaders himself in person. And there he said this. He said, Acts 20 verse 22, now behold, bound by the Spirit, I'm on my way to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit solemnly testifies to me in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions await me. I'm, I'm, I'm walking in step. The Spirit of God is leading, and he's leading me to Jerusalem, and I don't know what that's going to hold. What I, what I do know is that the Spirit has made clear in my heart that there is going to be challenge and pain and difficulty and affliction no matter where I go and whatever those next steps are. And so he's right in the center of God's will for his life, and yet his ministry is going to be full of affliction and challenge. 
He goes on to say, I do not consider my life of any account as dear to myself so that I may finish my course, my race, the path that God has set for me and the ministry which I received, not that I'm striving in my strength to achieve, not that I've chosen, but I've received from the Lord Jesus to testify solemnly of the gospel of the grace of God. Following Jesus, Paul understood, meant embracing Uh, threats and challenges, but that didn't matter to Paul because he understood. We don't get to decide if God's call in our lives is easy or difficult. We don't get to decide what kind of cost we want to pay, if you will, from a human perspective to walk after and to follow Christ because the ultimate goal is not to avoid pain. The ultimate goal is to follow Jesus. And following Jesus as it was true for Paul and as Paul is trying to intimate now to Timothy and is true for us, Sometimes following Jesus and being exactly in step with the Spirit of God puts us right in the center of difficulty and pain and challenge and struggle in lots of areas of life. And yet there's a calling that God puts upon us to press into that and to walk through that to fulfill his calling for us. That's what Paul is telling Timothy throughout this letter. Timothy, the ministry there is hard, it is challenging, it is difficult, you are young, they're going to look down on you, you have these stomach issues, there are going to be these real challenges, but Timothy, you've got a calling, you've got a goal, you've got something that you've been sent by God to do, now be faithful to that, follow through with it, do what God is calling you to do with your life. It's a reminder to us that serving Jesus is not easy. We think about hard places like, we, and we've heard them even mentioned by missionaries from the platform recently, hard places like China or areas of the Middle East or other countries where they are not friendly to the gospel, where anything that is related to Christ is squashed by those in leadership. But the reality is that ministry is challenging in every context, whether, whether it's in China or whether it's in Chattanooga. Because every ministry context has the reality for each individual of our own wrestle with our flesh and with temptation and with pride and with any number of things that that are there that we've got to deal with within ourselves, but also the realities of being a part of of God's people and seeking to lead in this culture and being a part of of a place, again, among God's people, even in the church where where, where we're not all yet fully like Jesus. We all have areas where we are growing. And so And so church is not all Bible studies and baptisms and singing songs and praying together. Sometimes somebody will join our staff and, or, or join the staff of church I've seen over the years, and they almost expect that every day is like a prayer gathering. Every, every person who comes in the door just loves Jesus with all their heart, that every person on staff just walks around with a halo on their head and just loves the Lord with everything they are and never is fleshly and never difficult, is never challenging. None of those things are true. The reality is that serving the Lord means serving with and among people who are not yet perfected. That, that it includes uh, correction. It includes shepherding people through some of the worst and hardest, the most challenging things in their lives. It includes dealing with difficult leaders and dealing with, um, at times, challenging individuals who are in leadership roles. It, it involves standing for the gospel and standing against the, the, the false teachings and declaring the truth. And those are challenges that are not just true of elders and deacons and leaders in the life of the church. Those are challenges of every man or woman of God who would desire to be used mightily by God in the church and in the culture to help point people to Christ, to help people come to know Christ, to find and to follow Jesus. And so in the light of the challenging nature of ministry, we find Paul writing to encourage and to charge and to spur Timothy on. To not only continue his own personal growth in Christ, but also to to continue and to follow through with the the mission that's been given him by God, specifically for this season at the church at Ephesus. And so as Paul's encouraging and challenging Timothy, I, I want us this morning to invite God through Paul to encourage and challenge us as we read Timothy's mail. Now, last week we saw in chapter 6, Paul confronts these false teachers who are motivated by greed, by a love of money. They think that religion is a means of of great gain, that they can peddle religion in a way that would line their own pockets. And now he's going to set a very strong contrast. There are these lovers of money, but he says in verse 11, but Timothy, that's not true of you. But you flee from these things, you man of God, and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, perseverance, and gentleness. Verse 12, fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. I charge you in the presence of God who gives life to all things and of Christ Jesus who testified the good confession before Pontius Pilate that you keep the commandment without stain or reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ 
which he will bring about at the proper time. He who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone possesses immortality and dwells in unapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see, to him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. That's strong. Can't you just feel like the, the elder, grizzled, veteran, father figure Paul as he's writing the letter, almost as if he's trying to reach through the pages and grab Timothy by the shoulders and say, Timothy, you can do this. You're, you're not one of these worldly men. You're not one of these lovers of money. You're a man of God. And God has called you, and he has equipped you, and he has prepared you. And yes, there are hard things if you follow Christ. Yes, there are difficulties attached to the calling that God has for you. But Timothy, do what God is calling you to do. And my prayer is that this morning we would hear him and we would feel him. As if Paul is reaching through the pages and grabbing Brian Kinlaw by the shoulders, is reaching through and grabbing you by the shoulders and saying, you man or woman of God. There's a calling on your life. There's a desire of God to use you to influence and impact this world and this body of believers for Christ. And you can do it. You, and, but it's going to be challenging. There are going to be difficulties. But for you, there's a call. There's a call. Notice we're going to see three things. That God is calling us to action. He's calling us to faithfulness. And he's calling us to worship. Listen, first of all, there's a call to action here. Paul, again, is uh, in verses 11 and 12, he's just addressed these false teachers and their greed. This is the third time in this letter, chapter 1, chapter 4, chapter 6, that there's sort of this extended moment of speaking of these false teachers. This is clearly one of the primary reasons that Timothy is being sent there is to confront them, to correct them, in some cases to remove them and replace them with qualified men. And on the heels each time that he addresses these false teachers, there is all, in each case, there's a, it follows with a charge. Timothy says, all right, here's what they're doing. Timothy, you're not that way. Here's how you're to respond. And we see that again here. Again, and verse 11 begins in the Greek with the but you, emphatic you. There's a strong contrast. You're not like this, Timothy. This is not who you are. But instead, Timothy, you are to, verse 11, flee from these things, man of God. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, perseverance, gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Do do you see that four strong, forceful commands, imperatives, calls to action from Paul to Timothy? That if he's going to follow Christ, if he's going to live for Christ in a world that is set against Jesus and in churches where leaders can get sideways... This requires not passivity, not, you know, let go and let God, not, well, just pray and hope for the best. No, it's going to require action in surrender to Christ. Timothy says, you're a man of God. That phrase was first used of Moses back in Deuteronomy. It's used of David and Elijah and others. It always speaks of someone who is a representative of God, who speaks the truth of God. And again, it's as if Paul is, is building up Timothy. He's looking at, he's writing through the pages, grabbing him by the shoulders and saying, look, you're not a boy anymore. You're a man. And you're not a man of money and you're not a man of the world. You're a man of God, Timothy. You can do this. You've been equipped for this. You've been called for this. You have been strengthened for this. You are not alone. God is with you. You can do this. And so he says, if you're going to be this man of God, if you're going to live out your calling appropriately, there's action to be taken. There are commands to be followed, and he gives four of them. And it's very interesting because this is very, um, uh, this is very consistent for Paul where he often has these passages where he says there's something you're to take off and there's something you're to put on. There's something you are to run away from. There's something that you are to run toward. We sort of get that same feeling in this list of commands. He says, first of all, flee from these things. And the, um, the tension there is constantly, habitually, this is not, you're not going to turn from it one time. It will be throughout your life, Timothy. You're going to have to continually seek to turn away from, to move away from, to run away from these things. Well, what things? Well, He's been talking about divisiveness and greed and heresy and um, uh, twisting the gospel to say things it doesn't say. Living based on man-made tradition versus the gospel that was entrusted by the apostles. Uh, Having a greedy heart that is 
materialistic. and they, All of these things that he's been speaking of throughout this letter. He's saying, Timothy, that's not who you're to be. That's how, not how you are to live. This is not who you are. They are money's men. You are God's man. And you are to live differently. God's people are not to be greedy. Are not to be divisive are not to be materialistic. And so when we have the opportunity, as God opens our eyes, as God, then we are, these are things we are to flee. If we're in a moment and we've got a choice to either build unity or be divisive, flee divisiveness. If we've got an opportunity to be generous or to be materialistic, then flee materialism. If we've got an opportunity to embrace truth or to embrace man-made ideas and my own philosophies, flee from that heresy and embrace truth. There are some things as the men and women of God that we are to flee, but instead notice there are some also some things that as we turn from that we are to run to, that we are to pursue. And again, the phrase in here, the, the tense in here is continually, habitually, constantly pursue. And he mentions six Christian virtues. He says pursue righteousness. That's the idea of doing what's right before God and man. Behavior marked by obedience to God's command. Timothy, run to that. Pursue that. Seek to know what God has said and then to live according to what he has declared. He says, pursue godliness, this abiding desire to glorify God through every part of one's life. A reverence toward God that produces God-likeness in you. Run to that. Pursue that. He speaks of faith and love, faith being our confidence that God is who he says he is, that God will do what he says he will do, and we act upon that belief. Love being that benevolence toward others, that self-sacrificing benevolence toward others that chooses to respond in a loving manner. It's not, a, it's not about a feeling, it's about an action. So, Timothy, when you have the opportunity and you're faced with some choices and decisions in life, Always choose to pursue, to run toward those things that call you to trust in God, that call you to love God and to love others well. Pursue that. Pursue perseverance, that patience, that endurance underneath the blows that life will bring your way. Pursue gentleness. Engaging the opposition in a manner that facilitates repentance and reconciliation. Timothy, when you've got a choice between being a brute and being gentle, being gracious and being gruff and aggressive. Run to gentleness. Pursue that in your heart and in your attitude and in your mindset. And so, again, as the man and woman of God, there are things that we are to flee. There are things that we must pursue, that we must chase after, that we are to run toward. He also says that there are some things that as we, as we seek to, to be active for the glory of God, fulfill God's call in our lives, there are some things, there are areas where we must fight and there are areas that we must take hold. Notice the third command, fight the good fight of faith. Literally, agonize the good agony of faith. That was a military term that would then turn into a, um, a sporting term, an athletic term that had the idea of of a fight, of a battle, of a, of a war, of a struggle, of a challenge, of a contest. It's a reminder to us that to follow Christ is always to place ourselves in the midst of warfare. We need to pray for these young men and women and the adults who will be serving them this week at camp because I can assure you that, that as they seek to go and to hear what God wants to say to them this week, warfare is going to break out among them. To discourage, to defeat, to frustrate, to divide. To, and so we need to pray for them. But, that, but not just for them, for ourselves. There is a real battle that we're engaged in. There is a, a battle, not in, and he says it's a battle for the faith, for the gospel, for the truth of Christ. If we're going to stand for Christ in, in the midst of the current and the culture of the world in which we live, if we're going to contend for the faith in the midst of a world full of deception and lies, then there is a contest, there is a fight, there is an agonizing that will come with that. But as we do so, listen, we do it not in arrogance or pride or worldly anger, but in love, gentleness, righteousness, dependency upon Christ, the very virtues that he's just said that we're to pursue, that we're to chase after by the way, there's a reminder here that the unbeliever or the strained believer is not the enemy. They're not people to be defeated. They're to be people that need to be won. 
The battle is not with each other. The battle is not with that person who rejects Christ. The battle is not with that obstinate believer. The battle is not with the battle is with a real enemy who seeks to kill, steal, and destroy. The people around us who are hurting, the people around us who are uh, um, who misunderstand, the people around us who fail to understand the truth are not people to be destroyed or defeated. They're people to be won to Christ as we contend for the faith. There's some things that we're to fight, and there are areas where we need to take hold. Notice, take hold of the eternal life to which you were called, and you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Most believe he's speaking there of Timothy's baptism. That when Timothy declared his faith in Christ, he publicly was baptized. People were gathered around. He declared his, his faith in, his confidence in Christ. He was challenged to walk and to live according to that faith as a part of that moment in his life. He was declaring in that moment that he has embraced Christ and the life that is available in him. And Paul is saying, Timothy, grab a hold of that reality of eternal life. Eternal life is not just something that we're waiting for one day. Eternal life began the moment that you came to faith in Jesus. Life is ours now. Jesus said he's come that we might have life and have it abundantly, life to the full. He came not to add years to our lives, but life to our years to give purpose and meaning to our lives. That's not something we're waiting for one day. That's something in the here and now. We, this, is, this is ours now because we, we are victorious in Christ. Life is ours now because of Jesus' victory through his death, burial, resurrection, and his soon coming. Life is ours now. We are victors in Christ. Somebody said it this way, that before the starter gun is fired for the race of life, your name is already engraved on the trophy. Now, that's good, isn't it? By God's grace, you are a victor in Christ. And so it is a call to walk and live in that victory with a firm grip on that reality. Everything in your circumstances might say you are overwhelmed, you are overtaken, you are not victorious. But we're to lift our eyes beyond our circumstances to our Lord and to the gospel and to truth and to grab a hold of that reality of life in him. So look at those, again, four commands in those verses. Flee, pursue, fight, take hold of. These aren't commands of passivity. These aren't sit in our, our little holy huddles and, and, and hold our hands tight and pray and hope for the best. This is trust God, live and surrender to Jesus, but be bold and active in your faith to, to walk into the calling that God has on your life, trusting him, actively engaging in the world, in the culture, in the body of Christ for the sake of the gospel. We are called not to passivity. We are called to action as the men and women of God. It's a call to action. But notice, secondly, it's a call to faithfulness. Again, this is a pattern we see throughout this letter that Paul addresses the challenges of these teachers and then he says, but this is what I want you to do, Timothy. There's a charge, there's a command that's given. Timothy has a role to play as we do today. He, he's to be faithful to do what God's calling him to do. And so in verse 13, I charge you, I urge you, I command you, I direct you in the presence of God who gives life to all things and of Christ Jesus who testified the good confession before Pontius Pilate that you keep the commandment without stain or reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. The, the, the key phrase there is keep the commandment. The question is what commandment? Well, he could be talking about those commands we just reviewed, those four commands in the immediately preceding verses. He could be talking about the whole of this letter that he's been speaking about. It could be a more general call related to his walk with Christ and to his obedience to the, the call in the ministry. But whatever it is, what we do know is this, that it is a call to faithfulness. Timothy, you know who you are. You know what you've been called to do before the Lord. Now, Timothy, be faithful to fulfill your calling. Be faithful to what God wants to do in and through your life. Timothy, you don't get to pick and choose what ministry you want to do. You've received this ministry from God, and you're to go and to do what it is that God is calling you to do. To be faithful to that calling. And the same is true for each of us. You have a calling on your life. That there is something that God wants to do in and through you uniquely. There is a course that God has set for you. There's a race that he would have you to run. And it's different from the people around you. 
We're not trying to compete with one another. I'm not trying to outrun you. I'm not trying to outdo you. I'm not trying to outpace you. I'm not trying to get on your track and to run the race that God said for you to run. I'm called to run the race that he's called me to. And in my life, that means that he's called me uniquely. Nobody else in the world that can do this is to be a loving, faithful, caring husband to my wife, Buffy. Nobody else can do that. Nobody else can be the father to Ty and Braden, to love and lead and serve them well. I'm one of three that's called to love and honor and to, um, to care for my mother. I'm uniquely called, at least for this season, to be the senior pastor of Woodland Park Baptist Church. Those are all a part of the calling that God has on my life. And all of those can have different challenges and struggles and difficulties that are associated with them. But I'm nevertheless to be faithful to and to fulfill that calling on my life. There's a calling that you have on your life related to your family, related to your career, related to to the people of God, related to, to the whole of your life. There's a calling that God has on your life. And it's not to run the race that others have. It's to do what God has called you to do. And it's to be faithful even in the challenges, even in the struggles, even in the difficulties that might come. And to give weight to that charge from Paul to Timothy, by extension perhaps to us. Notice he says he makes this charge before God who is the giver of life. He's the one who's the creator and sustainer of it all. The one who we're accountable to ultimately because we are entrusted with this life by him. And we are answered to him as a source of life. And before Jesus who is our supreme example of one who remained faithful and embraced the calls. When he talks about Jesus' good confession before Pilate, most believe, and I think it's true, it's a reference to Matthew 27, for example. Matthew 27, 11, Jesus stood before Pilate, before the governor, and he's questioned and said, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus, knowing that to say yes, knowing that to answer in the affirmative was to set a course that would move him toward this brutal death on the cross, says, it is as you say. So knowing the cost involved, knowing the price that you would pay, Jesus still declares and speaks and lives the truth. He is the ultimate example of that reality for us. So Paul says, Timothy, before God the Father who is the giver of life, the sustainer of life, who is giving you the very breath in your body before Jesus who himself was willing to pay the price and was willing to speak for truth even when it cost him dearly before the Father, before the Son, I am I'm calling you to fulfill your commandment, to fulfill, to be faithful to your calling and to do so without stain or reproach, without contaminating the teaching without contaminating the truth, without compromising or, or bringing reproach upon the name of the Lord of the gospel. And we're to do so, he's to do so, notice, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he will bring about at the proper time. How long is Timothy to fight the good fight? How long are you to fulfill God's calling on your life? Until it gets hard? Until you have to deal with difficult people. Until it would seem easier to get out of that marriage than to continue to to be a loving husband or wife. Until you get to, your fight the good fight as it relates to your family until your kids just get really difficult and then you get to give up and to turn them over and to just ignore it. How long must I stay true to the calling that God has for me? It's until I die or until Christ returns. And what I love about what Paul says here is that Paul doesn't reference the return of Jesus as if it's some nebulous sort of metaphysical something that will happen in some some sort of um, of, uh, uh, Dr. Strange sort of experience in the future. No, no. He looks to a bodily manifestation of Christ back to this earth to reveal himself, to set all things straight, to declare his glory, to reflect his power, to to draw attention to himself, that this is a reality that will come and it's going to happen at the moment that the Father tells him it's time for him to come. At just the right time. When I think that this is something, frankly, that we've lost in the last, I would say in my 25 years of pastoring, 
that early on, in, uh, it used to be this is something that we spoke more about, that we really believed that the coming of Christ could happen at any moment. And somewhere along the way, whether we become jaded or we've just become cynical or we've just come to say, well, they were talking about that for years and it still hasn't happened, so it's probably not going to happen. The Bible speaks to this imminent return of Christ. And it is the hope that we have. It is not, it's not as a believer that I live in this cowering fear that, that he might come back today. No, it's even so, come, Lord Jesus. Oh, when we look around at our world and we see the mess that our culture is in, it should drive us more and more to see that the world as it currently is is not as God intended. It is marred by sin, but he is going to set all things straight. And so we look to that hope of Christ coming, and we know that he is going to return. And so we may feel tempted. At times we may lose heart. We may become frustrated. We may feel overwhelmed. But Paul says, listen, whatever the challenge you're facing today, it will not go on forever. Christ is coming. And he'll set all things straight. And until then, by comparison to eternity, even the, the challenges we face are light and momentary. Paul says, compared to the eternal weight of glory that awaits us. And so we can make it through as we fulfill God's calling, as we remain faithful to what it is he's called us to do. We can, we can do so under duress, under challenge, under struggle, under pain, under strife. As we walk in obedience to, as we walk in step behind Christ, as we fulfill his course, his race for our lives. We can embrace that knowing that this is not going to go on forever. This is momentary compared to what is is to come and therefore we are again encouraged we're not fighting for victory we fight from victory the victory is already won and so in response to the needs of the church and the culture in response to the declaration of the living out of the gospel in response to God and to fulfill our calling on his his calling on our lives Paul says there's a call to action there's a call to faithfulness. And then finally, thirdly, there's a call to worship. Timothy and the believers in Ephesus faced tremendous political, religious, social pressures and challenges. Everything is sort of stacked against them, it would feel like. And, and they needed to be reminded of who they serve. They need to be reminded of who their commander is. They need to be reminded of whose corner they are in. And so Paul breaks out, and in these couple of verses, in verses 15, 16, he sort of stacks these descriptors in this doxology of who God is, of whom we serve, of who is in control in the midst of what's happening in our lives. He knew that, that similar to our, for them and for us, sometimes we lose perspective. Sometimes we, things get hard and things get challenging, and we need somebody outside of our circumstances to remind us of who God is, that no matter how the financial pressure feels, no matter how the, the marital struggle may be, no matter what the challenge might be with your kids in the present, no matter what the pain of that physical ailment you're going through, whatever, and the list could go on on the ministry struggle, whatever they, those things might be. Sometimes they begin to crowd out the bigness and the greatness of God. And when those, those things feel overwhelming and they feel controlling and they feel oppressive. And, and we need somebody to love us enough to, to help us to lift our vision up and to again see God for who he is. That's, by the way, what we hope happens here every Sunday. Is that through our prayers and through our singing and through God's word and through our time together, that whatever's been happening in your week and whatever's going to fall before you in the week ahead, that for this day we're helping to elevate your view to see God again rightly so that you are empowered and strengthened and encouraged to keep pressing on and to live for him. Notice what Paul says in seeking to lift their eyes, and I pray with lifting ours, this one who's overseeing the perfect time of Jesus' return is he who is the blessed and only sovereign the King of kings and Lord of lords who alone possesses immortality and dwells in unapproachable light whom no man has seen or can see. To him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. Paul stacking up the descriptors. He is the blessed and only sovereign. The word blessed there is not happiness. It's not based on what's happening in our lives. It is, it is the idea of satisfaction. God is deeply satisfied and content within himself. There's never been a single moment where God has ever had a panic attack. There's never been a single moment where God has had any moment of anxiety over what's going on in your life. 
There's never been a single moment of hand wringing or frustration or fear or concern on God's part as to how things are going to turn out. God is completely satisfied, completely content within himself, and he is the source of contentment and satisfaction for us as we look to him. As we find our confidence and our strength and our hope in him. He is the blessed and only sovereign. In, in Ephesus, they were called upon to worship the Caesar as a god, to worship at these various um, temples that were to the various Roman and Greek gods. But Paul is saying there's only one true God who is in control. There's only one who possesses all power and all strength and who rules over the whole of the universe. Everything in our lives right now, including the challenges, including difficult people, including difficult circumstances, including the struggles that come with following Christ and fulfilling his call in our life, it's all under his hand. It's all under his feet. It's all under his control to bring about our good and his glory. Can we say amen to that? He is the, notice, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He's the king over every king, every dictator, every, um, every president, over every authority. He is the Lord over every master and every supposed ruler on the world. All things are under him. All things are under his control. And if that is true, who does Brian Kinlaw have to fear? The answer is Nobody. No one, if I will live in appropriate fear and reverence of God, then everything else will begin to take a back seat. He is the one who alone possesses immortality, that is, who is truly immortal, with no beginning, no end, literally who is not subject to death. Death can't control him, can't overtake him, can't defeat our God. He's the one who dwells in unapproachable light whom no man has seen or can see. Certainly, this is a a reflection back to Exodus chapter 33 when Moses asked to see God and God reveals something of his glory, but he tells him, you cannot see my face for no man can see me and live. If God were to reveal himself in the fullness of his glory and us in our own goodness and righteousness, you know what would happen? We're all drop dead just like that. None of us, none of us in and of ourselves is worthy to stand before God who is supreme in his holiness. And yet in the New Testament we are told that we will see him face to face. How is that possible? Well, because God in his grace made a way that you and I might through faith in Jesus might be placed in him so that we might stand before the Lord not in our righteousness but in that of Christ himself and in Christ be made acceptable, be seen and, and observed and counted as holy and acceptable before a holy God. We will be with him. The one who dwells in unapproachable light has approached, has drawn near and veiled his glory while here on earth so as not to strike us dead so that he can make a way that we could one day be with him and see him in the fullness of his glory to such a degree that Revelation tells us that in heaven there'll be no need for the sun or the moon because his light will be the life for all. And so he says, to him be honor and glory, or sorry, honor and eternal dominion. In other words, let God always be respected and may his rule never end. And to that we can say with Paul, amen, amen. The only appropriate response to the greatness of God is worship. It's all of me surrendered to all of him. For his glory and for his purpose. In the blessings and in the challenges, in the struggles and in the hardships, he's worthy of all that I am and all that I have. And it is in seeing God rightly that I am then encouraged and spurred on to flee from sin, to flee from divisiveness, to flee from greed, to flee from heresy, and to pursue righteousness and faith and love and perseverance and those things that Paul has spoken of. It says, I see him rightly that, that everything within me then desires to contend for the faith, to fight for the gospel, to stand for truth in Christ and to grab a hold of the life that is mine in him and not lose heart and not let go. 
It says we see him rightly, that, that we are empowered and invigorated to, to fulfill our calling and to be faithful to what it is that God is desiring to do in and through our lives, no matter the cost. And so God, today, Father, today we pray and we declare with Paul that you are the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings, and the Lord of lords, who alone possesses immortality and dwells in unapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see, to you be honor and eternal dominion. 